welcome to Gotta Run. Hi, this is Will Sanchez. Tonight, my guest is Jonathan Kane. I happened to meet Jonathan a couple of years ago when I was running on Monday nights with Nike Town. But I really got to know Jonathan very well when I was picked for his team to do a Nike Plus challenge. The challenge was the group, as a group, we had to run as many miles as we could and see if we can beat out the other teams. Coach Jonathan was injured and couldn't participate, and we fell behind. But that didn't stop us because Jonathan made us feel like we were the stars of the team, and we came from behind and won the event thanks to Jonathan's great coaching and inspiration. So please welcome to the show, Jonathan Kane. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Jonathan. First, I want to congratulate you on your recent uh, marriage. Thank you. Yep, just uh, just about a month ago now, on 10, 10, 10. If you're a numbers geek and you marry a, a math teacher, you get married on 10, 10, 10. How do you guys meet? Well, it's funny that you already referenced the Monday night uh, Nike runs, which I've been doing since 2002. and. A few years back on a, I guess it was a June night, we had finished up the run and uh, I saw Nicole talking to a couple of friends down by Columbus Circle and she was on her bike but was stationary at the time and I just sort of very clumsily insinuated myself into their conversation and introduced myself and uh, thankfully she didn't laugh too hard at me and here we are uh, four years and change later and yeah, recently married. We found love on the run. Exactly. That's terrific. But Jonathan, let's get started then by sharing with our audience a little bit about your background. Where were you born and what was your schooling like? Uh, I'm a Bronx boy. Uh, so yeah, born, born in the Bronx, raised in the Bronx, uh, went to the Bronx High School of Science, uh, then stayed local, went to Hunter College for undergraduate, uh, got a degree in sociology, which I guess I don't get to put to work that much. Uh, and then while I was doing my undergrad work, uh, I was working, I was basically just sort of your garden variety gym rat, and I was working at a, at a gym uh, for MetLife. I was actually running and working in their corporate fitness center, and it just sort of opened my eyes to some of the science behind, uh, behind exercise physiology, and got a couple of certifications, and six months after getting my undergrad degree, was going to Adelphi University for my master's degree in exercise physiology. That's terrific. So um, at that time, were you yourself doing any running or any athletic events? I was, I, I mean, undergrad, I was the world's worst uh, collegiate basketball player ever. I was Division Three JV bench warmer, so I was, I was as low on the, the NCAA totem pole as she could be. Um, and running was, I mean, there it was pretty much punishment. You know, it is, it's, it's the old th saying about, you know, running, uh, you know, is your sports punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and did a couple of local uh, multi-sport events, did you know, some duathlons, run, bike, run things, but um, certainly didn't consider myself a runner um, all through undergrad. And then in grad school, um, started becoming a little bit more competitive myself um, and also became more and more interested in working with endurance athletes. So whereas most of my peers in, in the graduate program a lot of them went either into corporate fitness or into cardiac rehab. I just kept sort of gravitating towards working with, with endurance athletes. What is it about endurance athletes that, that captures your imagination? I, I kind of liked the, I liked that, that you can quantify things. I liked that, you know, as opposed to other fields where there's the sort of who you know aspect of things and, you know, sort of in my previous life, you know, all through my undergrad years, I was also a musician and, you know, you would see that a lot of times it wasn't, you know, music isn't always merit-based or whatever, but running and triathlons and cycling is, you know, first one across the line wins the race. Uh, you know, of course, there's always some politics and stuff involved, but it's pretty much, you can quantify, you can quantify results and improvements and, and I like the, the mindset of the athletes that I was working with. Mm -hmm. um, I like the, the ambition that endurance athletes display. I like the tenacity that they display and the dedication. And so that was really where, what, what got me excited, um, you know, and, and what really motivated me to become more knowledgeable and better at my job. Mm -hmm. Now, you've worked with um, amazing endurance athletes because I've heard you speak uh, when, you do, when you interviewed them. 
So uh, talk about one amazing thing an athlete did that sort of blew your mind or it would blow anybody's mind. Well, probably, I mean, the one that I always go to, um, my friend Chris Berglund, who I met Actually, the day I started grad school, I also started a new job uh, at a place called Printing House Fitness Center down in, in the West Village. Um, and I was working there, and I had finished my shift, and I was just working out. And I'm watching this guy running for an hour, and he was just flying. And he looked beautiful, like perfect form. And I struck up a conversation afterwards, and I asked him who he runs for. And he said, oh, I'm not on a team. And I said, well, who would you run for in college? And he said, oh, I didn't run in college. And I said, what's your 5K PR? And he asked me what a PR was. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, what did you just do on the treadmill? And he said, oh, I did an hour at 10 miles an hour. So he was running six-minute miles for recreation. And basically, I told him that if he'd listened to me, I'd make him a star, and he'd make me look smarter than I am. And that was 1989, and you know, here we are, 2010. And among other things, he has set the world record for a 24-hour treadmill run. Um, so, to, to answer your question, you know, yeah, the, watching him run 153.76 miles on a treadmill in a 24-hour period, My running nonstop, goodness. was that was, was the was most. Was he in amazing. competition with someone else? Yeah, at the time? Dean Carnazzi, who a lot of folks know, who's an author and frequent, uh, you know, cover boy and stuff, was going for the record as well. Christopher had met him doing the Badwater Ultra. Um, and invited Dean to, to shoot for the record with him. So Dean came in from, from California. We had three treadmills, one for Christopher, one for Dean, and one that was just sort of the, the spare and the guest treadmill. Um, and the two of them went for it side by side, which I thought was actually, I, I was impressed that Christopher, you know, they invited Dean to, you know, he invited his competition, who was probably the favorite, was the more accomplished athlete at the yes, time. Yeah, better so. known. Uh, did, uh, did Chris do uh, what's the uh, bad, bad water? Yeah, he'd done bad water a couple of times and finished his highest fourth place, I believe, and was and the I highest believe that's like rookie. 135 miles. 135 miles through Death Valley in June or July. It gets up to 120 degrees. The last part of it is up Mount Whitney. It's it's, it's brutal, unimaginably brutal. Yeah, I mean, I remember Christopher, who I mean, and like I said, I mean, he has that world record. He's won three triple Ironmans. He's done all sorts of crazy things. And he said to me after the first time he did bad water, he said that, and it's essentially what about five marathons. He said any 26.2 mile period in that was harder than any marathon he had ever done. I could imagine. Yeah, it was, the weather it was, was pretty brutal. amazing. But but yeah, so to answer your question, you know, watching him and being part of his support crew during that was probably the most exciting thing that I've been a part of, even uh -huh. though, I mean, obviously I didn't have a whole lot to do with it, but hopefully helped to prepare him for it. and. It was it was really humbling to watch, and it was also it was it, what impressed me so much was that he was able to you know what someone like you someone like me people who know a little bit about about running can look at those numbers and go wow that's amazing I mean the guy basically ran six four hour marathons in a row, um, but what impressed me the most is his ability to both that day and in general to relate to real people, if you will, to the, the average recreational athlete, the person who's doing 20 or 30 minutes a day on a, tr on a treadmill or on a Stairmaster just to get in shape. And he, he really respects those people, and he, he is inspired by them and tries to motivate them. And there's a real, there, there, there's a real sincerity in, in his relationship with, with people who a lot of other elite athletes might look at and sort of look down at, mm -hmm. um, but he really relates well to them, and that's something I've tried to. Obviously, I'm not nearly the athlete he is, but you know, I, I'm lucky because I get to work with people like him. I get to work with national champions, uh, you know, world champions. I've been very lucky at that extreme, but I also get to work with some people who are totally new to running, and that's rewarding in its own way. So. That's a way you know, in which I've sort of learned from Christopher that you know to really respect whomever I'm working with and be excited if they're excited. That's a that's an amazing story. So you found this diamond in the rough, so to speak. Yeah. And it, somehow you were able to polish it into this amazing uh, running machine. Yeah, and I mean he's he's very gracious about it and gives me you know I think more credit than I deserve. But I, you know the bottom line is if I've been able to help him you know, f turn into the athlete that he is, even if I just had a little something to do with it, it's, it's quite, you know, it's That's rewarding fabulous. for me. And I think he wrote a book about Yeah, he wrote event. a book called The Athlete's Way. Um, 
and he talked, his father was a, a, a very noted, uh, well-known uh, neuroscientist, neurologist, and so he talked a lot about the sort of mind-body connection, and, and it's funny because in working with Christopher, because we've done a lot of things together, we've had some speaking engagements together and, and worked on, and done some workshops together, and you know, because of my sort of geeky academic background in exercise science, I tend to just sort of look at the machine in front of me, the, the, you know, the, the, human body. The, the human body and just sort of, and I'm just breaking it down to heart, lungs. Yeah. And Christopher really talks about the mind-body connection and, and it's interesting even having had Christopher in a lab as a subject, he's, he is, let's put it this way, he's less remarkable physiologically than you might think for someone who is as remarkably accomplished as he is. I mean, he certainly, He's got impressive physiology, but not off the charts. But mm -hmm. he, he looks at things differently. He's, you know, during that treadmill run, one of the stories I tell all the time, somewhere maybe 16 hours in, 18 hours in, whatever it was, I looked over at him and I noticed he was wearing a white singlet and there was blood dripping down both sides. And he had worn away the skin on the inside of his arms and his chest just from rubbing. Wow. And so I went to grab a new singlet for him and some lube. And I said, Christopher, I'll be right back with a clean singlet for you. And he said, for what? <laughs> and he was so focused and in, so, so in his zone that he didn't realize that he was bleeding. So the kind of thing that I would be whimpering about <laughs> and Me calling too. for a medic, you know, here he is totally focused. And so. Uh, you know, so it, it's funny. I mean, he talks about having learned things from me, but I've I've learned because he has such a very different approach than I do, uh, and I've taken some of those things. He sometimes, the, one of the other things I find real fascinating about Christopher is he, um, when he was training for uh, the Kona for the Hawaiian Ironman, he would train. He'd do almost all his workouts indoors. Mm -hmm. So he would go. Yeah, he would go literally from one Ironman to another months later never having set foot on the ground with, with his bike or, or out on, 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 you know, with his running shoes. So he would do all his runs on the treadmill, but if he was training for Kona, he would put on copper tone sports sunblock because that was the scent that he associated with being in Kona. Um, before Badwater, I think he writes about it in his book, he painted his ceiling black and drew in stars because that's what it was gonna look like running through Death Valley. Um, so, Again, whereas I just tend to look at the sort of science and the numbers behind these things, he looks at ways mind, to get the mind ready. Yeah, so, so you know that's why I think we've managed to work well together. Well, t tell us about City Coach. Is that something you founded? Christopher and I started that together, you know, and mostly because a lot of people were just attracted to him because of his athletic background. But he was the first to admit that he didn't really know when people would say, "Hey, coach me." He'd say, well, talk to Jonathan, he's my coach. Um, <laughs> so that was sort of the impetus for getting the business going. At the time I was working, I was the fitness director for the police department. I worked there for 11 years, um, but was also looking to do something a little bit more challenging and creative. And so got City Coach started during the last few years that I was working um, for the police department. And so we work with a variety of athletes, again, like I said, from, from beginners to, you know, we've had some, some really accomplished athletes. Um, and we do some online coaching, some hands-on coaching, and we work with runners and triathletes primarily. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, and, and you guys also, you give back to the community. You do some interesting charity work. <laughs> yeah, we've done, certainly a lot of our athletes do their own, you know, are involved in their own charitable endeavors, and we try and support them, whether it's coming out and doing a race, um, or just getting the word out that, that people are doing these things. You do something very interesting that I somehow discovered by accident on the web and didn't realize you were involved, and that's the high heels run. Well, yeah, that, that was oh, a fun one. In fact, one. we have the winning that's, guy, yeah, Shane, from your group. That's Shane, who uh, I actually met back in 2002. He was working at Nike Town when, we, when that program was started, so he was one of the coaches, um, and he and I immediately became friends. Uh, and then he came to work with me a few years later as City Coach was growing. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of years ago, one of our athletes shot me a note and told me that Regis and Kelly were having a high heel race. And you know, it was a 50 yard sprint and Shane comes from a sprinting background. So we were in our office one day and I said, uh, Shane, what's your date of birth and your mailing address? And he's telling me and I'm just typing stuff in. And I say, oh, by the way, you're entered in the Regis and Kelly high heelathon in a couple of weeks. And he just sort of looked at me like I was insane. Um, 
and the next thing you know, we're out buying, you know, three-inch pumps at Payless um, and practicing. <laughs> the, one of the funny scenes was um, in the sort of the, the Gowanus section of Brooklyn uh, on Seventh Street between Second and Third Avenue. We would go, and I'd measure out 50 yards, and we'd sort of make sure the coast was clear, no one's around, and I'd give him the sign. And he'd start running, and I'd time him for 50 yards. As soon as he'd get across the line, he'd kick off the shoes. We'd stand there. We'd wait for the cars to go by. As soon as it was clear, we'd go the other way. And so we, he would practice starting and practice working on, on your form for running with three-inch heels on. So, you know, we, uh, you was know, Was there just, a, a rules of the game? It had to be... Yeah, it had to be... Three inches? You it had to be minimum three-inch height. It had to be maximum three-inch circumference. No modifications were allowed to the shoes, so you couldn't tape them or strap them on or anything so and you know people kept joking with us that we took this so seriously and if you see you know if, if you were to see a group shot yeah most of the folks who were doing that race most especially the guys were doing it just you know Fun, as, yeah. as, a, as a joke but heck I mean he won a thousand dollars he's won it twice he won a thousand dollars each time so you know we sort of figure you know I mean we certainly want to have some fun but if you're strapping a number on and there's especially if there's a thousand dollars at stake might as well win the race, so yeah. It might cover the price of the shoes. <laughs> there you go. He, well, it was a good Women's investment. shoes are expensive. He, 20 bucks he spent on the shoes, so he made you know, 50 times his investment. Well, is, is that a charitable event? It's, it's, they did that, um, I think both years, Regis and Kelly, um, there, was, uh, there was a charitable aspect to it um, and, and whatever oh, we'll money see, they made. Uh, we'll see the <laughs> Zappos. Uh, uh, yeah, Zappos, Zappos was, one of the, was one of the sponsors for and this And I guess season. Kelly ran it, too, because yeah, she, has Kelly, the, she has a medal around her. Yep, Kelly her ran the women's race. And, uh, yeah, so I, I look at the smile on Shane. I yeah, mean, Shane looked very happy he has, for a man uh, He's very high proud of those, uh, those heels. Hey, he should be. He did a great job. And, you know, like I said, we were, you know, trying to be competitive, but we have some fun, too. I mentioned earlier that your mom passed away from, from a disease. What yeah, she had breast cancer. Okay, and then you honored her in a very special way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the last few years we've done um, a, a couple of different events. Um, in, in her memory, the first year, the beneficiary was Locks of Love, which is an organization that uh, makes wigs for, for women who, not, not necessarily cancer patients, but any women who've lost, lost their hair. Um, and I just, I remember, you know, when I would take mom for her chemo treatments, that all the women there would just be reading these wig catalogs and stuff, and it was, it was something that was important to them to maintain their appearance. So, uh, you know, we were able to, to help support them uh, to support that cause, and then... So you uh, shaved your head for that cause? Yeah, that one... I think one, we have a shot of, of you being shaved. Yeah, that one, uh, we... Well, because Locks of Love, I think you need about an eight-inch ponytail to donate. So, you know, some, some folks donated their ponytails, and our, obviously in my case, I didn't have... Uh, there's, there's Nicole, my, my now wife, shaving my head. So what we did was we, um, we did uh, an event where eight of us rode 100 miles on, on a compu train or on a cycling simulator. Um, miles for, for That was for Miles mom. for Mom, we called that one. Um, and that, yeah, that was the one that, that uh, benefited Locks of Love. And we also put a, an eBay auction up for the rights to shave my head. And the gentleman who won it was kind enough to then let Nicole actually do the honors. So someone paid a few hundred bucks to shave my head. Uh, and so that was my and, and way. That was the last time you had Yeah, that's, that, this is about as long <laughs> as it gets it, now. You liked it so much. It, it was it. funny. I was so traumatized and so afraid to do it, but I actually kind of liked it afterwards. So, yeah, we've kept it that way. So, yeah, then that, that was the, the first one that we did. And then the last couple of years, we've done an event um, in the store window of Jackrabbit uh, on 14th Street, their Union Square store. We there got it we on go. the screen. Yeah, it's called Race Across the Window, which is a takeoff on... Race Across America, which is a 3,000-mile bike ride across the country. So what we did was eight of us, uh, and again, there's Nicole riding. Um, so eight of us, as a relay, did a simulated 3,000-mile ride in the store window at Jackrabbit. So we basically, we were there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for a little over a week um, for that the past the first two time? Yeah, we did that in, in 09 and this year. Um, and both times it took us about a week. And it was, it was basically, it was just some of my athletes. And I'm, I'm very lucky, you know, so it's some of the coaches who work with me, some friends and athletes who I coach. And I just said, hey, I want to do this. And, you know, they sort of roll their eyes. And, but, but they do it and they support well, me. Jonathan, and it takes a very special person like mm, yourself to inspire you. people to do such a thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. I mean, we've, we've got a real good group around us. Uh, you sure are. And in fact, uh, we, I have a picture of one of the beneficiaries of that charity. That's, that's CAF, which is what's that's Challenge. the Challenge Athletes Foundation. So the, this year's event uh, supported the Challenge Athletes Foundation. Um, 
and uh, but this is Cody. Yeah, that's Cody McCasland, I believe is his name. Young man came by, and it was oh, he came so by. Cute, yeah. yeah, he's an adorable he's reaching kid. up. Yeah, he came by with his mom and his little sister, and they spent a few hours with us while we were doing this ride. And it was, I think, they came by on day six. So you know, by then, you know, I've been in Jackrabbit. You know, they were nice enough to give us the space, but it's not the most luxurious place to sleep. You know, Shane was sleeping there overnight, volunteering his time. I was there 14, 16 hours a day. You know, and you're a little tired. And, but then the kid like Cody comes by to say thank you, and you sort of remember why you're doing this. So, I mean, it was a fun and a challenging athletic endeavor, but I feel like if it were just an athletic endeavor, I wouldn't have been quite so keen on doing it, and I don't think the other athletes that were involved would have been quite so quick right, to sign right. up. But knowing that you had a young man like that who was benefiting from it, uh, it certainly made it easier to do. It's so wonderful that Jack Rapids worked with you on that. Yeah, they, they donated, like you said. The yeah, they've they've space. been terrific. Yeah, and, and I mean, and their staff was real supportive. I've, I've been working with them since really since before they opened their first shop, and they've been real supportive of our endeavors when we do these things. And so yeah, it's been a lot of fun working with them. And I guess you plan on doing it again. Yeah, we're we're trying to figure out what we'll do for 2011, but uh, but there'll be something. I mean, I, I've sort of resolved in my mind that every year I'll do something in my mom's memory and probably sucker some of my friends into helping me out with it. <laughs> well, it's a wonderful thing to do. And, Thank you. And a lot of people want to help out on that, so that's a wonderful thing. Let's talk about uh, some other things you do. I didn't realize that um, that you uh, do followed up with Doug Stern's event that he used to do every year, and that's the, uh, the Open Water Swim in January. Yeah, Tell us Doug, a little bit about that. Doug were, had a, uh, an Open Water Swim camp down in Curacao um, that he had been doing for years. And, and that's a picture of Doug. Yeah, <laughs> there's Doug in the water at Curacao. That's the Lion's Dive uh, resort in the background there. Just to remind folks, Doug passed away a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, also in so, 2007. So and Doug was continued the tradition. Yeah, Doug was was a very respected, very talented swim coach and, and an athlete in his own right, and just a just a great guy. And he passed away in '07, but they a, a few of the campers, the folks who'd been going down there regularly, kept the camp going in his memory. Um, so Kate Pennell um, and a few of the others, she's the one who sort of organizes it now. <laughs> she had been a regular at the camp. Um, and, and I know she talked with Doug's family about keeping it going. I don't think they necessarily wanted to be the ones to keep it alive, but I, I think they, that Kate got their blessing to keep it going in his memory and keep, and it's still referred to as the Doug Stern, you know, Curacao Open Water Camp. So, um, and I think over 75% of repeaters. It's, it's like, it's yeah, like it, uh, it, it's, I mean, I've been lucky enough. This will be my third year working it. I, I go down there with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mike Halstead is the other cycling coach. So the two of us run the, the cycling part of it, um, and then Vlad and Boris are the, the, the swim coaches. Um, and yeah, the large majority are, are repeat customers, and there are people who knew Doug and, and were, were loyal friends to Doug. And it's interesting, because the last couple of years, you know, there are now people coming who didn't know Doug. And a couple of the others made the point that, you know, there's something really positive about that, that that Doug's memory is being kept alive not only in people who knew him, but now people who never did meet, you know, get the pleasure of meeting him, are hearing about him and learning some of his methods and just sort of, and, and, and you very much feel his energy, you know, when you're down there. It, it's, I, I think that they've done a good job of keeping the right balance. I mean, Doug was obviously very serious about swimming and very serious about coaching, but we have a good time down there, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a beautiful place. It's a it's a gorgeous you can see, place. You can see from the uh, from that picture. No, it's it's a beautiful island, and the hotel is beautiful, and they they built a 50 meter pool there that's that was dedicated to him. So yeah, we get up bright and early every morning, swim and, and in the 50 meter did that pool. For many many years, like 15. 16 yeah, I think years, it was something like, like that. that. Yeah, you know, whereas Doug did it as a as a money making venture. That was how, how he made a living. The folks who were keeping it going now are pretty sort of insulated about it, mm -hmm. but uh, but each year, like I said, a few a few newcomers come, and uh, yeah, it's a great time. It's a nice balance between, you know, it's it's very much a training camp, but it's also very much a vacation. I mean, you're down in the tropics. It's you know, it's beautiful weather, and you know, you get out of the water and you you do your second swim of the day. You come out of the ocean and. Just about everyone's got a, a you know a beer in their hands and sitting by. You study the human body in terms of what it can do, and just we all know about the four-minute mile because that's the gold standard right. of, of doing a mile. But when 
Before the guy, Roger Bannister did the first four minute mile. When he was training for it, there was a lot of discussions whether it was even possible. Sure. Yeah, there was a lot of doubt, yeah. And some doctors are even saying, well, if anybody does it, they'll die. But now, the big, big topic is the two hour marathon. The record, I believe, is held uh, in Berlin, which is probably the fastest course for Real marathon. Fast course, yeah. Just under 204. Right. In your opinion, is it possible to get down the two hour marathon? I, I think it's, let's put it this way, I think it's certainly possible. I think it will happen eventually, but I don't think, I don't think the runner who's going to, to do that has been born yet. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in, in my lifetime. Um, if, if you look at what would have to happen, when, when you look at yeah, Haile Gebre Selassie who ran 203.59 under pretty close to ideal conditions, um, when you look at, at the physiology that would be required um, in terms of maximal oxygen consumption, in terms of, of an, a, an athlete basically who A, has to pick the right parents, you know, so they, he has to be born with the right genetics to have a, a ridiculously high VO2 max, trained to have a ridiculously high lactate threshold, and then on top of that also have incredible running economy. Because when you sort of crunch the numbers, the, 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 the VO2, the oxygen consumption that would be required to run a sub two is beyond what anyone has um, if they're running with even in anything close to normal running economy. So you would need, like I said, someone with perfect physiology and perfect mechanics, and then also on the perfect day. A course like Berlin, probably favorable winds, a pacemaker, you know, which was what, you know, when, when Gabriel Selassie went for it, he didn't really, wasn't treating it like a race. He mm -hmm. had hired pace setters mm -hmm. to go out there and, and, and help him along. Um, so in, in here, you know, and even so, he was still, four minutes away from it, you know, four minutes, uh, you know, 124 minutes, you know, four minutes out of that, that's three, that's over 3%. That's a big gap. And when you look at how long it took to get from 212 to 208, I think was probably 15, 20 years. 208 down to 204 was, I think, another 25 years or something. So you're reaching a point of diminishing returns and you're reaching a point where you're really stretching the limits of, of what we've seen from mm -hmm. the human mm -hmm. body so far. So. I mean, I wouldn't be the one to say that it'll never happen, but I, I, I like I said, okay. I don't think it's going to happen for a long time. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure. And, thank you. And we'll hope to see that uh, two-hour marathon <laughs> maybe in 25 years if the, uh, the record uh, pattern holds. There you go. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.